great pleasure to gather with you all on this, the second annual Angelic Doctor Lecture here at the Newman Center. St. Thomas Aquinas, the patron of our chapel, currently undergoing restoration and repair, was a truly gifted man known for his tremendous intellect and piety. St. Thomas was known for his ability to interpret his wide-ranging university studies within the context of faith in the triune God. He had no difficulty in dialoguing with his contemporaries regarding wide-ranging topics, including the natural sciences. It is our desire to continue St. Thomas's legacy by presenting lectures on culturally relevant themes which promote the intersectionality between faith and reason. We are most especially honored to have Father Thomas Davenport here with us this evening. Father Thomas Davenport, Dominican priest, studied physics at Caltech, graduating in 2004, and went on to receive his PhD in physics from Stanford University in 2010, working in theoretical particle physics. He subsequently entered the Order of Preachers and was ordained to the priesthood this past May. He has written and spoken on the relationship of faith and science in a variety of venues, including being a main contributor to the Thomistic Evolution Project. Currently, he is finishing a Master in Philosophy at the Catholic University of America and will join the faculty of Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island, this fall as a physics professor. Thus, it is my pleasure to welcome Father Davenport. Thank you very much, Father Peter, for the invitation and for the kind introduction, and thank you all very, very much for being here. It's uh, it's somewhat humbling to, to see so many faces. So thank you so much Excuse for. Me. Uh, yes, I can. We can't hear you. Okay, I can speak loud. Um, I'm a preacher. I've been trained. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's it's a great joy to be here, uh, to be uh, to be here in Toronto with you. Um, it's a great joy to be giving this angelic doctor lecture. Um, my name. Ooh, hey. Uh, my religious name, Thomas, I took after St. Thomas Aquinas, um, and he is uh, a wonderful patron and a great guy. And so I figured there's no better way to begin this lecture than by uh, a, a prayer that he composed uh, for study, that he, would, that he would pray before he, he himself studied or taught. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. O ineffable Creator, who from the treasures of your wisdom have established three hierarchies of angels, have raised them in marvelous order above the fiery heavens, and have marshaled the regions of the universe with such artful skill. You are proclaimed the true font of light and wisdom, and the primal origin raised high beyond all things. Pour forth a ray of your brightness into the darkened places of my mind. Disperse from my soul the twofold darkness into which I was born, sin and ignorance. You make eloquent the tongues of infants, refine my speech, and pour forth upon my lips the goodness of your blessing. Grant to me keenness of mind, capacity to remember, skill in learning, subtlety to interpret, and eloquence in speech. May you guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to completion. You who are true God and true man, who live and reign, world without end, amen. 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 The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love that prayer uh, because it, it's written by St. Thomas, my church patron, but it, it, it it clarifies and classifies everything that St. Thomas is about. It begins with God, the creator, who created the marvelous order of the universe and, and brought us the ability to come to know and to love that, to, to understand that order and to work towards uh, working the, moving away from the, the ignorance that we, that, that we are subject to and the sin that we are subject to, to come to know the created order, and in that created order to come to know the creator. And even more importantly, to know the Redeemer whom he sent, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, with that, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you today about uh, this topic of a Catholic perspective on evolution. You might find it odd that a particle physicist is speaking on evolution, and this particle physicist finds it somewhat odd as well. Um, I am not an expert in evolutionary biology, but uh, I, 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 I have friends who are. Uh, but I've been, I've been part of a project of a number of Dominicans to think about this topic of evolution in the context of uh, the Catholic faith, and most especially the, the philosophical and theological tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas. And so I have thought uh, on my own, in my own studies of physics, about the philosophical implications that, that come into that, and about the, uh, the relationship of faith and science in general, and have, in the working of this project, learned to bring that to bear, particularly on the, the conversation of evolution. Now, this is a huge topic. Um, I think the attendance here kind of speaks towards that. So I can't claim that I am going to, in this uh, 
somewhere between 45 and 50 minutes, uh, explain every single answer to every single question that you possibly have about evolution. What I hope to do is to lay out a basic picture of how it is that, that the, the Catholic faith and the Catholic tradition can be a great aid to understanding something of the difficult topics that come out of uh, our wrestling with the natural world, specifically with the, the, the theory of bio, or the, 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 the evidence for biological evolution. So I want to begin with uh, 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 this little story. So on October 27th, 2014, uh, there was a bit of a hubbub in the news. Uh, Pope Francis was a little over a year into his pontificate, and he had done it again. Uh, Pope Francis had, had broken one of those huge taboos that Catholics had, and he was, and, and, and he was, he was by just sheer force of will, bringing, bringing newness and life into the church where there had been, been emptiness and nothingness before. And this time, what had he done? He had said that it was okay for Catholics to believe in evolution. Now, uh, for Catholics who think about these things, the, the immediate reaction to this was a little bit overblown. And, and just as a point of, of evidence of this, uh, I, I put on your, um, your intro, the, fir the, the first three quotes, are three sentences about evolution, one of which is a sentence that Pope Francis said, two of which were written by others. Um, and so uh, if you look at these three sentences, evolution in nature does not conflict with the notion of a creation, because evolution presupposes the creation of beings who evolve. <coughs> the second, evolution is in no sense at variance with the theistic or Christian theory of life. And the third, view a priori, then, and restricted within the legitimate fields of empirical science, the hypothesis of theistic evolution contains nothing that our faith requires us to condemn. I don't know about you, I'm not a, a linguist per se, but those are pretty similar sentences. Uh, there, there's, there's nuances, difference of tone, difference of, of, of emphasis, but this notion of there's something about evolution and about our Christian faith, our understanding of life, that, that, that seems to be able to work together. So, the, so which of these is the sentence by Pope Francis? The very first. Um, what are the other two sentences? Who were they written by? Well, the second sentence was written in 1929 by a Paulist father uh, in a book called The Question Box. Uh, and so this Paulist father had a ministry of going around to state fairs and random uh, gatherings in America, mostly among Protestants, and putting out a question box and say, ask it. Let's see what's going on. And, and, so in this book, it's, it's a book aimed at a general audience, at anybody, um, trying to, and, and, and particularly those who are questioned. And it came out of questions, particularly that, that many of our Protestant brethren had for the Catholics. So most of them cover topics of theology and things like that, but he has a section on evolution. And in that, he makes this statement that evolution is in no sense at variance with the theistic or Christian theory of life. This was 1929, so this is, comes out of his work for you know, decades leading up to that. The theory, Darwin's theory of evolution came out uh, in 1864. This is only a generation or so afterwards where there is public proclamation to a general audience, in a, into a general Catholic audience, even in evangelical uh, uh, efforts of Catholics, to speak about the, the possibility and the reasonableness of evolution. The, set, the, the last is, is close to my heart because this comes from a Dominican student brother. Uh, so I, myself being a Dominican, having been a student, Dominican student brother just recently, um, uh, we, uh, this comes from a publication that was put out by the Student Brothers, written by men who were in formation for the priesthood, and this was published in September 1923. Uh, again, before the Scopes Monkey trial, before many of the, uh, the, the, the public clamoring over evolution. And here is a man who is intending to become a Catholic priest, who has been given permission by his superiors to say something positive about evolution in 1923. The point I want to, to, to get across is that there is a confusion and, and, and a narrative about what it means to be Christian and how that fits in with our understanding of science, and even what it means to be Catholic, what it fits, how that fits in with science. And much of that narrative is, is flawed. Now, I have to say, I, I had intended to, to go on Google and find a nice Toronto newspaper that had some really silly thing to say about Pope Francis and, uh, in, this, uh, in this quote. And I was actually pleasantly surprised by the Toronto Star. They actually had a very reasonable perspective on, on, on what Pope Francis said. They mentioned the fact that Pope Pius XII, back in the 50s, had talked about theistic evolution as Pope, and, and the, that, that Catholics should, should at least investigate and think about how evolution could fit with the faith. And he talked about how Pope, Bern, Pope Benedict, the conservative, exact opposite of Pope Francis, who Pope Francis was trying to overdo everything Pope Benedict had done, even Pope Benedict had espoused a view that some of the, these conflicts between 
sort of very uh, strong creationist notions of reading of scriptures, and and uh, those that, that that proposed the notion of evolution were, in a certain sense, absurd. That he says that those who believe in the Creator would not be able to uh, those who believe that in uh, in the Creator they would not be able to conceive of evolution, and those who instead support evolution. Uh, oops, sorry, I got the wrong. So, sorry. Uh, he he states out that there that. The notion of evolution, the notion of believing in a creator can fit together and work together in a, in a coherent and, and beautiful way. So that is kind of part of the narrative I want to try and work against in this, in this talk. And so there are three main points I want to get across. One is historical, one is philosophical, and one is theological. And I hope to be able to, to get through those uh, and, and, and present, not, maybe not answer every question, but sort of present some of the foundations upon which this conversation should be led. So first, to, to the historical point, because in many ways there is an impression, even among Catholics, even among Catholics who, who see that evolution can fit, we can find a way to think about evolution in a Catholic context, to bring together the scriptures and evolution, have this, this inkling that this is a new problem. Reading Genesis chapter 1 and six days of creation, like that was pretty easy up until about 1860. That everybody, since the beginning of, since the beginning of Christianity, I looked at Genesis chapter 1 and saw six days means six days, uh, and, 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 and that's that. And, and this notion that it was only in the light of modern science that we had to suddenly start getting creative about the way that we read Scripture. Get, get interesting and sort of think deeply about, okay, well, we've got to shift this a little bit now. We've got to, we've got to find a new story for this. And this idea that something about the Genesis narratives in particular had been under attack in a particular new way that had never been seen before. And that... This is, this is, you know, this is a reality you have to deal with, and we can deal with it, but it's a new thing. And frankly, that's just false. In fact, Genesis chapter 1, the, the story of creation, the first story of creation, is one of the primary loci around which the church fathers worked out the nuance and the theory of how it is that we're supposed to read Scripture. In part because they disagreed heartily on exactly how to read it. There were some church fathers who read the... Read the, the uh, the, the six days as six 24-hour periods. That that this happened and this happened. This is the way the Bible reads. This is the way that we. That this is the way it must have happened. There were others who want to say, well, no, it's it's these are periods of time. There is a length of you know. So a day is like a thousand years in the mind of God. So maybe it's not 24-hour periods, but this talks about the progression of creation that God is working. And there were others who said, no, that the notion that. There would have to be more and more activity by God in creation is, 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 un, is, is philosophically untenable. That, that we need to talk about, excuse me, that there is, creation is one act, one beautiful, marvelous act of God, which is expressed through the, through the notion of six days in order to talk about the ordering and the beauty and the priority in which these things were created. And that it is, in fact, a, 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 an image that shows us the unfolding of creation uh, out of this one act of God. And so there is this, this breadth in the way that in the first two or three centuries of the church, uh, leading into particularly to the fourth century, that the, the church fathers are already thinking very hard and deeply about this because they, they are basically taking every possible philosophical notion of where the world came from or how the world could be within certain parameters, still, still insisting on the notion of God as creator. And yet taking on every, what we, what we would call, scientific picture of the origin of the world and trying to understand each with each sort of independently and then somewhat together how to understand the scriptures in the light of these, uh, of this understanding of how nature works. And I think this comes out most profoundly in St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine, who himself wrote uh, at least three commentaries on Genesis. Uh, um, and, and was very concerned about getting Genesis right, because at one point, before he became Catholic, he was a Manichae, and believed that, that basically the physical world was evil, that spiritual things were good, the physical world was evil, there were two gods, one who created good stuff, the spirits, one who created bad stuff, the matter, and that's, that's, how, that's how he understood the, the notion of the world. As a Catholic, he knew that was wrong, but that meant he had to understand why the heck was, how, how did God create? How do we understand the goodness of creation? And so he says some very profound things about how it is that we should read Scripture in general, in these passages of Scripture in particular. 
And, and one of the most profound is, is on uh, the, the second quote, uh, in the, the first quote in the second section. In matters that are obscure and far beyond our vision, even in such a way we may find treated in Holy Scripture, different interpretations are sometimes possible without prejudice to the faith we have received. In such a case, we should not rush in headlong and so firmly take our stand on one side that in further progress in the search of truth justly undermines this position we too fall with it. That would be to battle not for the teaching of Holy Scripture, but for our own, wishing its teaching to confirm, conform to ours, whereas we ought to wish ours to conform to that of sacred Scripture. He has this notion that we need to be careful about what we, that, that, that the very first word to jump off our, the, the very first image we have in our mind that jumps off of the, the page from Scripture, particularly in these matters that are obscure and far beyond our vision, the notion of the very beginning of the world, we need to take care in the way that we approach these things. As an example of this, and I think a helpful example, one of his commentaries on Genesis is literally called a, liter, a literal commentary on Genesis. Which, to our minds in a modern context, when we think of a literal commentary on Genesis, what do you think of? You think of six days means six days, 24-hour periods. Let's count the number of days in the Bible. That's how long the world has existed. That's what we think of as literal. This, this, is, Gen this, this is Augustine's reading of uh, the notion of the words, let there be light, in his literal commentary on Genesis. But if the light spoken of in, all the, wor in the words, let there be light, and light was made, must also be supposed to have a primacy in creation. It is nothing other than intellectual life, which must in its, be in a formless and chaotic state unless it is turned to its creator to be illuminated. I, light doesn't, I, that, that notion of light as, a, as, as intellectual light, intellectual life, is, doesn't sound literal in that first sense, in that sense of, of six days. He thinks this is literal. Why do you think this is literal? Because he is trying to probe the mind of the author of Scripture. In the Catholic tradition, literal, the literal reading of Scripture is hugely important. Everything we read and study in Scripture, all of the beautiful moral and spiritual truths that we gather, are rooted in the literal reading of Scripture. The literal reading of Scripture is not a literalistic, a simplistic reading of Scripture. It is seeking to know the mind of the author of that scripture, the mind that was inspired by God, that mind that was used by God as an instrument and brought all the creativity of that mind, all the creativity of the experience and imagination of that mind into the writing of scripture. His, his or her, in some context, his or her or way of being, his or her experience of life, her, is her community brought into the reading of Scripture. And so it is not simply just reading a word and looking it up in the dictionary. It is a, it is a, a theological search to understand how it is that these, that these, these readings come, uh, uh, are best understood. So that's, I think, a hugely important principle that is not new. St. Augustine wrote in the 4th century uh, AD, this is an ancient and, and long-standing tradition in the Catholic Church. Now, it has, there, there, are, there are new things in the way that we approach Scripture because we have a new understanding of the created order. The, the church fathers don't write anything about evolutionary biology. It turns out they didn't know anything about evolutionary biology, so they didn't have that to draw on in their reading of Scripture. So we don't, we, so we, but, but we, who have this context, can and in fact should, as Augustine tells us, bring that into our thoughts and into our hearts in how we try to approach the Scripture. Now, this is not to say that, therefore, anything goes. Let's just do whatever we want. Because there are key fundamental truths in Scripture that are not simply part of this obscure and far beyond, the, the, the obscure aspect of what is far beyond our vision. And this, I think, comes out in particular in, in the quote I have by St. Thomas Aquinas. So this is him 